Well, we're going to dive into our next lesson on engaging the powers and some things that that don't really work very well. Um, somebody had mentioned talking a little bit just for just a very brief moment about house church, uh, and I'll just give you a little thumbnail of that real quick. Uh, so, when when pandemic happened, when COVID happened, um, you know, we uh, started meeting at home and in the backyard, invited neighbors, people came, we were masked up, sitting in camp chairs really far apart, you know how all that was. And uh, more, more people came, more neighbors came, some of the church people came, uh, and we began to kind of really think, like maybe it seems like God's doing something different with this, and so what, what's going on with that? Uh, and so I, I, maybe I shared a little bit the first session yesterday on this, but uh, so we decided that this was a church, and I resigned from the uh, traditional church ministry to, to pursue that. We're trying to plant, at this point, we're trying to plant one house church a year. We're kind of hoping that this summer there's a few things we're going to put in place for, to kind of speed that up. Uh, but the gist of it is, uh, is that, you know, we're a group of about 40, 45 people, and we mostly, in, in Alabama, we can mostly meet outside. It it's, doesn't get, I mean, in the winter, during COVID, we met out, outside every week for a year. Uh, and there was not a single Sunday that it rained for that first year. And it was really, it was such a blessing. We, we had formed a prayer team and we decided we're going to just pray about as many things as possible. And so we look at the forecast, you know, during the week and we'd see rain on Sunday. And so we'd send out to the prayer team, please pray it doesn't rain on Sunday. We want to meet. And then sure enough, it wouldn't rain. And we said, wow, look, for a whole year it did that, you know. And there was one Sunday we had just wrapped up, said amen, and the, the drops started hitting. And we were singing When the Billows Roll and all that, you know, <laughs> about the storm and all that. And we thought, we're not singing that song again. Um, that was risky. But it's been a really great time. It's small. It's transformational. Um, you know, early church met in homes. And I, I, I have, uh, it's never when I talk about house church, I don't ever have, there's no judgment of like, we're doing it right. And others, wrong. Like, there's none of that. Like, that's just silly. Like God uses all sizes, God uses all kinds of stuff, and so uh, we're just kind of one more expression of one other way to do it. And um, we, um, you know, we sing, we have we have worship, we take communion every week, um, we have lesson, and uh, one thing that we don't do, which is kind of odd, but we actually don't pass collection. And it's uh, because I don't invite you to my home to pass a tray to you. Right, it's a little awkward. We found that to be like, how, how are we going? Hmm, that's a little weird. And so, what we what we actually discovered was, if you have conversations with people about the value of giving, and don't make it territorial, and you know, just whatever God lays on your heart, you give where you want, where you need to give. Uh, that for us, this is not. I'm not saying this is a prescription. I'm just describing, not prescribing. Was that people actually can figure out how to give. Like they actually got online and figured it out. And it was like, that's, that's kind of amazing that, you know, God provided really what, what we needed. We did have to raise a little bit of funds outside of that. Uh, and uh, God provided what, what we needed. But we, uh, we have some rhythms with House Church that we've adopted. So the first Sunday of every month is Prayer Sunday. And the idea is that we're going to pray before we do anything as a church, we're going to pray about it. So our first Sunday of the month is devoted to prayer. We do have a lesson. We do have communion. Uh, typically, we sing a song. There's certain weeks maybe that doesn't happen, but prayer is the focus, and we just pray about all kinds of stuff. And then even our kids will be like, "Can you pray for me and my friends at school?" And then it's like, and then we'll pray for them, uh, and you know, ask them, "Well, would you like to pray for your friends at school?" Oh no, can you pray for them? You know, and so we'll gather around them and pray for them. And you know, our kids know that they're part of the church. They're not. Uh, we do. Two Sundays a month, we'll put them out during the lesson time for age-appropriate lesson through Awana material, discipleship material. So that's the first Sunday. The second and third Sunday is like a full-on worship Sunday with lots of singing and just the typical kind of like we did last night. And then the fourth Sunday, uh, we call it potluck worship from 1 Corinthians 14, 26, where he says, when you come together, each one of you brings a song or a hymn or this or that. And so we kind of thought, well, what if we practice listening and we gather together and we said, and, and during the week we, we message and we say, hey, it's Potluck Sunday, come with a testimony, how do you see God working, is there a song on the radio that, you know, you like, a, that's just hit you at the, you know, tell the stories, these God stories, we want to hear God stories every month, 
bring a scripture, you know, bring something to pray about. So the first Sunday we did that, three people brought the exact same verse. We were like, what? Like, what the, statistically, what are the odds of that? Like, that's not real high. And so then we, we stopped everything and we were like, why did God want us to hear that today? For you, like what, what, what was meaningful for you? And then people started speaking why they thought they needed to hear that today. And, and so the point is we're trying to be in tune with God. And so we sit and listen and we say, if you feel like God put something on your heart, then just speak up. We'll wait a few minutes and somebody ask a question or share, share a story or something like that. So that's kind of some of our rhythms. And then like fifth Sundays, we'll have a meal or it tends to fall close to an Easter or, or Thanksgiving. And we'll kind of tie a meal in with, with some of those. So um, that's a little bit of what we do. And it's been a very sweet time. It's been good for our kids who um, are just fully involved in everything we do at church. And they know that the older people love them and talk to them and come up. They're 13 and 15, and we have 75, 80-year-olds who walk, how was your week? And tell me about your running and, you know, all this. They just, they know they're loved. And um, it's been really, really good for, for our boys. Uh, so that's a little bit on house church just for a second. Let's, let's talk a little bit about what our part is not in engaging the powers. So... There's kind of three options. There, there really is no option in engaging the powers, the dark, powers of darkness, the principalities. There is no option. We engage them every day. You know, we just need to be intentional about it. You can't say, well, I'm just not going to engage. That's also engagement, right? Uh, and so first is you can work for the powers, and you can be enslaved by the powers. You can work for the powers. This is being, being lost. This is being out side of Christ, and so you're doing his work. And then you can also work with the powers. Think of like Peter in Galatia when he opposed Paul. Uh, he kind of separated from Paul, and Paul associated with the Gentiles, and Peter was kind of doing some work with the powers. He was bringing some division. He's still a Christian. He didn't stop being a Christian, but he's also doing some work with the other side there. That's when we sin. You know, we all do that. We're all aligned with Jesus. We have faith in Jesus, but sometimes we are with the other side in some of the things that we're doing. And then the third is you can stand firm, you can combat, and you can help others get out. Uh, and so when we think about the first two, you know, working uh, under or working with, um, there's a lot of things that we do, like um, our, our quest for power, our quest for influence, rational rationalizing evil, manipulation, um, things like escalation, like when you don't get your way, you escalate things up. It's a power play. It's power dynamics that uh, doesn't really play on, on love or kindness or compassion. It's like I'm being selfish and I'm going to get my way and I'm going to raise my voice until I do. It's very childish, but we adults do that. Um, deceit, all, all the things. I mean, you know, all the all the Galatians 5, you know, opposite of the fruit of the spirit, the works of the flesh, it's all working with him and working under him. Um, and, and, and the hard part is that's the stuff that comes most natural to us. Um, that's how our flesh operates. And it's the easiest path is just default into that stuff. It's a lot harder to put up a fight than just kind of give up. And so if we're going to put up a fight and we're going we're gonna to stand opposed to the opposer, Remember, Satan opposes, the word Satan means the, oppose, the opposer, one who stands opposed to God. We're going to oppose the opposer. It's going to be a little tiring. It's going to be draining. It's going to be, but, but it's also life to the full. It's also life abundant. It's life in community. So we're going to talk about that, like don't do it alone. Um, so let's look at these, the secular view of, of power here for a moment. This is what we're immersed in. The power structures and tactics of the world are all around us every single day. And what's really deceptive about that is they seem to work, right? Like you can seek out power, authority, all the big things that, you know, are not always so great for us. And it seems to work for you. Like you seem to advance, you seem to kind of get your way, you know, all these things. It kind of seems like it's, it seems kind of pragmatic. As Americans, we love pragmatism. And one of the things that's hard about discipling and apologetics and the whole works is like, there's no guarantee of success. Like as far as like, I can love my neighbor and reach out to my neighbor for 35 years and nothing 
seems to have changed. You know, like we we want to we want to as Americans, I know we want to engage ourselves in things that we think we have a decent probability of being successful at. We don't like to fail. And the the, the powers of darkness, those approaches just seem to work. It seems like seems like things start happening. It's not all good work, but. Uh, you know, and this is what Satan was trying to get Jesus to engage in. We'll talk about that more tonight, but Matthew 4, you know, there's a shortcut to the plan. There's an expedient route. The ends justify the means. You know, these are all those kind of things that we, we wrestle with in our flesh. And when we do that, we are participating on the wrong side of, uh, of the battle. And if you remember in the beginning, Satan's temptation was you can be like God. That's tempting. Because I'm not like God, and I don't have everything but if I did have everything, I would be secure. Uh, I, I think in my mind, right? Like my kids would probably be okay. I wouldn't have to worry about where the food is going to come from, where it's going to have a roof over my head. Like if I could be like God, like it would seem like everything would be like amazing. You know, uh, it does sound amazing. And, and Eve thought it was amazing sounding enough to risk dying over it. Because she knew what he said. Unlimited power, unlimited resources. Uh, and so guess who you wouldn't need if you had all that? God. And Satan wants us to think we can have all that. And, and, he, and he offered it to Jesus, didn't he? You can have all that if you'll do what? Bow down and worship me. And it's interesting that we keep coming back to worship, too. And I, and I wish we had like a whole session or two on worship. Um, because worship, worship is battle. Worship is combating the powers. When you sing those songs that um, you're going through a really rough patch, but you sing those songs of hope and faith, kind of like just poking an eye, poking him in the eye, it's like, I believe that. I'm suffering, I'm struggling, things are hard, but man, worship is like, we still believe. We're going to sing those songs. And especially as our culture has shifted away from like singing out loud, like singing out loud seems kind of weird to people. I'm like I'm a little weird, a little uncomfortable. Are you sing out loud? Like that's what the strange people do in the musicals, you know? It's like, um, no, we sing out loud. It's different. We look different. We act different because it's different and it's good. Uh, you know, John twelve thirty one. He's Satan's called the ruler of this world. He's called the prince of this world. Like he's got some power somehow, and I don't really understand quite, you know, why God's worked it all the ways that He has. A lot of it's, you know, result of our poor decisions and all that. Um, but he does have some power in this world. I mean, look at Job. He had to kind of ask God's permission, but ultimately God said, you know, you can affect his life. You can be involved in his life. So here's some things that we really need to avoid in fighting the fight. The first is to not act like the world acts. Even though it comes very natural to us, and even though we're surrounded by it every single day, and we're immersed in worldly activity to not buy into it. That's hard. Israel was slaves in Egypt, and eventually they had slaves. You would think, like, you should know better. Wait a minute. You know what, Matt? People have lied to you, and it hurt, and you have lied to people. Knowing how bad that hurt, right? Wouldn't you think you'd know better? Wouldn't I think I might know better? It's like, well, you do know better. But we still do some of those things. Um, I was reminded of 1 Samuel 15, so don't act like the world acts. 1 Samuel 15, um, Saul conquers the Amalekites. He was told to destroy everything. And then Samuel comes, and they have this discussion where Saul says, Hey, Samuel. Guess what? We just like we did everything God said to do, and then Samuel's like, "Why am I hearing the sheep? Like, what's the bleeding of the sheep and all that?" And then, and then Saul says, "Because uh, it says that they had spared the best." Here's what it says in fifteen nine: "But Saul and the army spared Agag, the best of the sheep and the cattle, the fatted calves and lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed." This is our theology of weakness. Embrace the weakness. Give God the best. It's like God's in charge. He's doing the heavy lifting. We're just trying to be in line with him. And then it says, when Samuel reached him, Saul said, Lord, bless you. I have, I have carried out the Lord's instructions. Huh. 
And then it says, but Samuel said, you know, what's the bleeding of sheep in my ears? And Saul says, the soldiers brought them from the, the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and the cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God. But we totally destroyed the rest because we're going to give it to God. I just, you, you just happened to show up, you know, and now we're going to give it to God. Um, he's acting like the world acts. And he's the king. I mean, literally, the king just said, well, I'm the king. But the soldiers, they went and did the, you're the king, man. Like, they're, they're following your lead. And they were following his. This was the way he leads, right? But he's acting like the world acts. He's not respecting God whatsoever. And so there is no, there is no apologetic if we're just like the world. And in the U.S., there's a lot of studies that have been done over the last 10 years that just keep demonstrating time and time again that people who say they're Christians act just like people in the world. Divorce rates are the same. Rates of various things are the same. Like Behavior-wise, attitude-wise, it's like so aligned. And not, not 100%. You know, we know that. But it's like more than you would like to see. It's like that's kind of not, not a good thing. Uh, and so... How do we have any apologetic, any defense of our faith if we're not any different than the other side? Right? There is no defending the faith. And we know people are watching our actions more than they're listening to our words. Right? Um, and so why would the world gather with the church if the church doesn't look any different than the world? And I'm not saying this is y'all. I'm just saying, like, I see this where I'm from. Uh, and so, and, and I think in, in America, at least, and, you know, there's mega churches and there's churches of 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000. And I'm, I'm not saying the bigger you get, the more wrong you are. I'm not saying that either. But there, there was the attractional church model. There were things that some churches were doing that was like, uh, and I don't, there's certain things I, I, I have in my memory that I don't even want to say that I've seen online, like churches were doing. We were like, what in the world? Like, how did that get approved? Like, you know, can't even get a couch for the youth room over here, and you're doing, it's like, good grief. Um, but there, there's no purpose in being part of church if church looks just like the world. And, and you know, y'all are different and understand that, and we're, you all are trying to push into the darkness and make, make a real difference. But we got to remember that being distinct is actually part of our apologetic. Because people, there are people who are actually looking for something different. They already know what's in the world. And if what they get in the church is just like what they get in the world, then it's like, why not stay home? You know, uh, the second is to not do God's part for him. I'm really bad at that one. Uh, God does the saving. We do the inviting. God does the growing. We do the sowing and the watering. That's 1 Corinthians 3, 6 through 9. I planted, Apollos watered, but God has been making it grow. Neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything. There's that weakness, that submission. We are low. We are, you know, God is sovereign and supreme. We are nothing, but it's God who makes things grow. Uh, the, the one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose. We do have a purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-laborers in God's service, for you are God's field, God's building. We're servants, we're laborers. Paul would say in Romans, you're slaves to God. Sometimes in English it's translated servant, but that word literally always means slave. Um, Acts 2.47, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. God adds to the church. My job is not to add to the church. Now, the results of some of the things I do trying to be faithful can result in adding to the church, but I can't add people to the church. God adds people to the church. So think about Pentecost, you know, 3,000 people. And you could say, well, Peter preached this amazing sermon, and that's why it happened. Well, no. Why were the people even there? Pentecost. God told them to be there. Peter didn't tell them to be there. And then when he started speaking and all these languages were heard, who did that? The Holy Spirit did that. And I assume that whole road to Emmaus conversation plus the Holy Spirit, like Peter knew the, the scriptures to connect. And, and he knew from following Jesus and all the teachings he got from Jesus, how to connect all the dots with David and the Lord said unto my Lord, put, you know, all that. Like he knew how to do all that because of Jesus and because of the Holy Spirit. Like the whole thing's grace. Peter wasn't like, look, I, I had a th he didn't say I had a 3,000. God did that, 247. So the whole thing, it's like, we're just trying to show up and be 
faithful over here. In Luke 12, 11 through 12, I love this passage because when you think about sharing your faith, this just puts all the pressure on God. When you are brought before synagogues, rulers, authorities, do not worry about what you will say to defend yourselves, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. Now, I think God can still do that. I was talking to, um, I was at at, um, Pepperdine last week, and um, there was a, a guy there who uh, had heard we're doing house churches and he came up to me and he was like hey our church this summer we just planted this church and uh, we we're going to kind of go to like kind of like house church during the summer and I'm a little bit nervous about it and I will tell me more like what what are you nervous about he's like well what if a guest comes and they're like this is weird or they say something weird, or something weird happens, or they're uncomfortable, something. And he's like, like, I don't really think about that in like the big church because there's just so many people and I got an order of worship and it's all under control and I know where it's gonna go and I know who's gonna say what and all this. But when you go to the house church thing, like I'm, I'm, I'm a little scared because stuff can happen. And I'm like, yeah, stuff can happen. Like that could be good because we're getting out of the way, then like stuff happens. And then, because what happens is when we have all that control mechanism and then we come out of the thing, we're like, we kind of did, I mean, if we didn't do it, but it can feel like, wow, we did a great job, you know? But when you like make a lot of room and then weird stuff starts happening and even sometimes you're like, I don't know if that was good, you know? God, like we're talking on the break, God can take all that stuff and turn it into amazing things. So I was like, think about it like this, like somebody, a visitor comes, And somebody says something that you know is going to offend that person. And you're like, oh, no, this would have never happened in the big room. You know, like, "Ah, this person's never going to come back. And like all this self-talk, right? And then what if that gets handled so gracefully in that space that that person is like, I didn't like that, but. I've never seen a group of people act like that before. That would have never happened with, you know, song prayer. Ta, ta, ta. And I'm not condemning the or, uh, I like order. And God like actually God actually likes order. Um, but when you make room for that, to our control side, it's a little scary. But it leaves all kinds of room for him to do some really cool stuff. And he's like, oh, wow, so that's actually an opportunity to actually see God work. When I'm not pulling all the strings, like, absolutely. Uh, so we trust the, the process. So uh, number three, don't do this alone. And this has a couple of aspects to it. Um, one is prayer. And so I, I'm going to try to do this quickly, uh, very quickly. So one is prayer. Uh, we ask others to participate through prayer. Some people are senders. Some people are goers. Some people are prayers, right? So uh and so we ask, we ask people to pray for us so that God will help. Uh, we go with people. When Jesus sent out people, he sent them out in pairs. That's really important. Not, don't, don't do this stuff alone. Uh, and if you're going to talk with somebody, you know, send out a, a text or two to some people. Hey, please pray at 1 o'clock or 3 o'clock, whatever. Uh, in Acts 16, the Holy Spirit blocks Paul from going into Asia. Or he wanted, I'm sorry, he wanted him to go into Asia, but he blocked him from going into, um, and the man from Macedonia calls him, Acts 16, 9. And that, that's when he finds Lydia. That's when he goes and ends up in jail, which sounds terrible. But that's where he gets the Philippian jailer, and all these amazing things start happening. But, but he wasn't doing it alone. He was doing it with God. So we need people, and we need to make sure we're doing it alongside with God's lead. Um, okay. Number four, our part is not to use our freedom in Christ to enslave others in what we were set free from. And that's Galatians 5. You know, he says, you know, don't use all this freedom as a way to kind of tie up other other people. Sometimes we find freedom from things and then we just want to bind everything up on everybody else. And it's like, that's that's pretty destructive. Uh, The fifth one is don't take shortcuts on the process. We like fast, God moves slow. Think about how many times that it took for you to hear the message or for someone to invite you or that's, it's like, um, if we've been in this a long time, we feel like if I just invite or say, you know, at least in the States, it feels like, well, they should just be, we know they're not going to be receptive, but then we feel defeated when they're not receptive the first time, you know, and I think studies show it's something like seven attempts before someone's kind of like, huh, 
Yeah, maybe I should think about that. We like to think, like I said earlier, think really, really fast. We move really, really fast. There's actually a little book called uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. And the author died maybe a couple weeks ago, I think, or a month ago. And that book really helped me a lot because I, I think really fast. And the book basically says, sometimes you need to think slow, but you're thinking fast. And sometimes you're thinking fast, but you should be thinking slow. So some things are automatic. Like, you know, when you drove someplace, but you don't remember the drive? That's kind of weird. You're like... That's kind of strange, but that's that automatic. It's just so automatic. And then, but some things take intentionality and slowing down, right? And God works through slow process, thoughtful process. So I have to be careful with what I say. There's multiple times I've had to come back to a conversation and apologize. I did this at our Easter egg hunt with our kids. Somebody said something about some stuff with some medical stuff, and then I shared something I it wasn't very sensitive, and I just didn't think about it. And I, had a, I left. I drove back. That was so dumb. I'm so sorry. Um, and just, I, we'll wrap up right here. So um, Betty Davis has this quote where she says, getting old is not for sissies. And uh, this, this battle is not for sissies. Is it? But the good thing is, you, you got to be tough. But the good thing is, is that Jesus is walking right along with us. The Holy Spirit is helping right along with us if we'll just give it a try. So let's be patient with people. Let's be kind with people. And we're going to talk more about Jesus uh, this evening and uh, walking through some of the, more of the gospel um, tonight. So I appreciate y'all's time and patience and attention. I know it's a long time we talk, uh, you know, for this long. So uh, let's pray. God, it's just so natural to do what comes natural to us, but we know that doesn't always lead to the right things. It doesn't always come from the right place. And so, God, we ask that we can open up our hearts to receive what you want us to see and share with others, God, not just to understand, but to live and to share the good news of Jesus. God, I know for me, for many, many years, it was just seemingly enough just to kind of try to understand it, but it just seems more and more that living it and sharing it is just such an integral part of the way you set this thing up, that we're your body. You are the head, and we're the arms and the hands and feet and ears and all those things, and God, you you are using us in this world, and so we just pray, God, that you would use us to, to do your will, and we would like that to be just mighty things with amazing numbers and all of that, but the main thing, God, is we just help us to be faithful. Help us to keep showing up. Help us to keep be loving. Help us to keep you sharing, God. And it would just take all of that. And like you said, with that uh, mustard seed in the kingdom, that a hundred times can be grown from that one little seed, that little humble seed we throw in the ground that we have no idea where all it goes. You can do amazing things with it, God. That one little conversation that we didn't think much about or that one big conversation that we prepared for a long time for and prayed a lot about, you, you can just take it all and do amazing things, God. We trust you. We love you. Thank you for each person here, God. In the name of Jesus. Amen.